Hypersonic missiles travel at least five times the speed of sound. And they're a growing investment for the U.S. military. The Army and Navy are both advancing their programs and working together to maintain a decisive edge against adversaries. Lieutenant General Neil Thurgood is a director for hypersonics, directed energy, space, and rapid acquisition at the Army. Vice Admiral Johnny Wolf is director for strategic systems programs at the Navy. <coughs> Gentlemen, welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to start with a general question, which is, why are hypersonics so important to each of your services? And I'll start with you, General, for the Army. Great. Well, Mamie, thanks for letting us be here today. It's a great, great honor to be here with you today and, and, and my, my battle buddy, Johnny Wolf. As we look forward in, into the future of what warfare might be, uh, we try to anticipate what the capabilities we'll need in the Army. Uh, and we have a modernization strategy in the Army, and, and we often hear of 31 plus 4 signature programs. Hypersonics is one of those signature programs. And so as we look to the future of the pace and the distance and the speed of warfare, we want to make sure that we put our service in the best position to be successful on the battlefield. We believe that hypersonics are one of those weapon systems. And Admiral, what about you for the Navy? Yeah, so for the United States Navy, if you look at what um, our strategic competitors have done, um, it really is about bringing a capability to the high-end fight. It really is about the Navy being able to continue to get access to where they need to get access and to really hold those higher um, level strategic targets at risk, which is what the United States Navy does as they forward deploy all around the world. You know, Admiral, the U.S. and China are in a capabilities race for hypersonics. What's the current state of hypersonic technology in China? So in China, as they continue to look at what they do across all of their systems, um, obviously if you read uh, at the unclassified, they're making a lot of, of, of progress on their hypersonics. But for us, it's not about chasing China or Russia for that matter. It really is about what I just went back to. It's really about giving our warfighters an advanced capability that will continue to make us the best competitors that we that we have out there and to really provide that deterrent value um, which is what the United States Navy does. There was that uh, test that China conducted of a hypersonic missile and that was pretty surprising to a lot of senior military officials. It was um, but what I would tell you again is as we look to what the United States needs to do it's not necessarily to counter that. Again it goes back to giving us a capability such that we can uh, remain competitive and we can always lead and not have to be worry about where we're being behind. And General, what about Russia? What are they doing? So similar to what, what, what Vice Admiral Wolf talked about, you know, Russia has, has uh, been modernizing their forces. Part of that modernization for Russia has been hypersonic weapons uh, and that, that they've been pretty public about that. And so again, it's, it's not trying to keep up with them, it's trying to create the conditions so that when the military is asked uh, by our nation to go to uh, to a particular place and do a, a particular activity that we have the right capabilities on that battle space. The, the be able to reach far and fast is part of that capability requirement <coughs> and so it's important that we we maintain as much competitive edge as we can to give our soldiers, our sailors, our airmen, our marines, our space force the opportunity to be successful on the battlefield. Are you confident though that we can maintain that technological edge? Well, I think it's up to us as a nation to decide that. Uh, we get to, to, you know, through Congress, we get the resources that, that are applied to the Department of Defense. Those are given to the services, and each service has a role to play. Uh, I, I'm confident that as we are focused as a nation and as a service, as, and, and I think we realize as services that we all fight together. There's, there, you can't just go as an Army or as a Navy or as an Air Force. It's all together in a joint fight with our allied and partner nations. And as long as we keep that focus, I think we can maintain our competitive advantage. You know, the, uh, as you said, the Army <clears throat> has a program, the Navy has a program, the Air Force has a program. How are you working together and how are those programs differ? So I'll, I'll start and then I'll turn it over to, to Johnny. So first of all, we're really fortunate that, that we have Vice Admiral Wolf as a partner in his team. Um, we, we have decided early on the program that the Army and the Navy would partner together and have a, the same weapon system, uh, the, the, the missile system. Uh, we obviously use those from a land component versus a sea component, um, but we, that technology, uh, we don't have to be 
parochial in the service perspective. We can join forces, we can partner together, <coughs> and we can garner our resources together to be successful. And so that, that partnership is really important. It's how we keep ourselves at pace and how we keep industry focused as well uh, with a single voice between the two of us. Yeah, if I could add to that, so I, I think General Thurgood's absolutely right. As we've looked at how we've set this program, I think it is actually, I won't say extremely unique, but it is pretty unique in the fact that in order for us to be able to deliver a capability at pace that our nation needs, what General Thurgood and I have done is, and you brought up multiple programs that we've got across the Department of Defense, our program is essentially one program. If you look at the weapon that we're going to deploy, it will be exactly the same. If you look at how we think about the, the things that we will use this for, although it will be different target sets, it will have the same capability. And by doing that, it's allowed, to General Thurgood's point, it's allowed us to really keep each other honest and really press these technologies forward at the pace that we need to do them. Uh, Admiral Wolf, we're talking about how you guys are working together, same missile, different ways to launch different platforms. What class of ship is the Navy going to be use, using as a platform for hypersonic weapons? So for the Navy, what we've decided, we're actually going to do several classes of platforms. Um, our goal is, first and foremost, to get to the new DDG-1000 class um, destroyer that the Navy has developed. The plan is to get to that by FY25. And then the follow-on to that is to actually get to a Virginia-class submarine in about the 2028 time frame. Again, because as we talked before the break, it's all about strategic advantage. And multiple classes of, of platforms for the Navy with varying missions that we can then absolutely cover everything that we need to cover is absolutely critical. Tell me a little bit more about the DDG-1000. What are the advantages of using that? So the DDG-1000, if you look at it, first of all, it's a visible presence all right, from a surface ship. But it's also a class of, of platform that's been developed which is stealthy. So as you combine those two and you put a weapon system like this on that to be able to forward deploy, to be able to be stealthy, and to be able to be successful, um, that is why the Navy has looked at the DDG-1000 as the first platform that we'll put this system on. And, and you mentioned submarines. I would imagine that there's some, you know, especially difficult <laughs> uh, technological ways to launch from a submarine. There are, and, and actually that's part of the reason my organization uh, is in the lead for hypersonics because, if, as you said, if you look at underwater launch technology and what it takes to take a weapon and launch it from underneath the water, get it above, and they need it to light off and fly, there's some challenges there. But we've done that in this country a long time. And so I'm confident we've got both the government workforce, the military workforce, and the contractor workforce that understands that um, to meet those challenges. Uh, General, the Army will launch from ground-based um, mobile launchers. How will that work in the Pacific theater? How would you get those over there or close enough <clears throat> that you can launch? Well, it's really important uh, as part of the joint force that we fight together and we have multiple ways to engage the enemy from multiple directions. We would say multiple dilemmas that we create for the enemy. Uh, and the ground version of the hypersonic weapon is not only road mobile, but we also move it in C-17s. And so uh, we have fielded our first unit already in September, which is in their, what we call new equipment training. They've already done air movements off of C-17s uh, and, and practice loading and unloading and fly around. And so where, where we can move is really important uh, because we may have access to certain locations to fire from and we may not have access to others. So it's, it's the ability to drive it where you need to, but really to move it around the globe where you need to. So the freedom to move both on the seas and in the air uh, for this asset, given its length and of, of distance for targeting and its speed, gives the, lots of opportunities for our combatant commanders uh, to be successful. Tell me about the timeline to get an operationally deployed capability. So right now for the Army, uh, we have the requirement to have an operational capability in, uh, by 2023. We fielded all That's of the That's right unit. around the corner. It's coming quick. <laughs> it's super fast. It's really great. Uh, we, we fielded the first unit in September of 2021 and gave them all of their equipment minus live, what we would call a live round, bullet, you know, a missile. And they're going to practice with us. And when we do flight tests uh, jointly with the Navy, they'll come to the flight test. And so we're going to use every opportunity we can 
to train them, to get them ready. And then in 2023, early 2023, we'll start delivering live munitions. And so by the end of uh, 2023, they'll have an operational capability. So what have been the most pressing challenges you've faced on this road? Well, I think there's been many. Uh, as, you, as you try to do things that are very difficult, very on a very rapid pace, um, I would say the, the, the hardest thing we have to do is, is number one, get past per service parochialism. Right. It's a partnership. Uh, I, I couldn't have a better battle buddy than, than Johnny Wolf. Then we extend that to industry. Uh, in this particular technologies, there's not a mature industrial base. So as we develop the technologies, we have to build the industrial base. And so uh, we got together with a strategy and, and we have an industry board of directors, uh, the, the major companies that can do this, that prior to this, they were our competitors and now they're all on one team. And to their credit, it was a little hard at first. Uh, do we really trust each other? Are we really going to tell everything, everybody? Uh, they got past that, and they're doing quite well. And then our, our challenge will be to make, to move this from the labs of our nation, which is where the great folks that, at Sandia National Labs and other labs around the country uh, made the technology. Now we have to get it into an, an industrial base. So and this is what I wanted to ask you guys about, which is producing <clears throat> at scale. And, and the, the defense base, that the, the contractor base, essentially, that needs to be able to do that. Are you confident that, that we'll be able to produce at scale? So we are ramping up as we speak. And so you, back to your question, so, and, and what Neil just talked about, um, we, we, as we've started to get into this world of hypersonics, which is pretty advanced technology, um, I think the partnership with the services, the partnership with industry has been tremendous. And it did take a while for us to get jump started, but I, with the investments that the DOD is making um, to make sure that we have all of the capacity understanding that we need to have, and with industry leaning forward, industry has really leaned forward um, this in this arena, and they've invested quite heavily in getting buildings ready to go and getting capacity uh, that we're going to need both from the workforce as well as the infrastructure. So yes, we're on that path, but we still have work to do. There are special materials, though, General, that these weapons are going to need because you're traveling so fast at mock speeds. Um, are those materials available? So I think similar to, the, to what Johnny said is uh, when, when you're in the labs, you need uh, a certain amount of material to do the work and to, and to advance that work even beyond what we're, we're planning today. Um, but when you need thousands, you're going to need a whole lot of that material. Th that's exactly right. So as we do that, we have to invest the department has to invest in industrial base and industry has to invest so that partnership is is together um, we can't go from zero to a thousand right. overnight it, it's not going to happen <laughs> so we have a very deliberate process uh, because sometimes we think moving at pace means you don't do everything correctly or you cut corners that's absolutely not true you, you, we can't afford to do that we can't afford to put our nation in a position where we 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 put our sailors and soldiers at risk because we cut a corner somewhere. So you have, you have to go at pace, at standard. And, and we get asked a lot, and I'm sure Johnny does too, yep. can you go faster? We would love to go faster, but you, you can't go from zero to a thousand. Yep. You, you've got to go up on a nice controlled scale. Uh, we're doing that as fast as we can, but you have to build the infrastructure around the weapon system. Um, Admiral, it's no secret that hypersonic weapons are going to be very expensive. What are you doing to keep costs down? So as we get into transitioning from development into production, one of the things that, that General Thurgood and I have set up is we are looking at how we transition these systems to industry because as we built them early on as prototypes to test in a lab environment, you're, to your point, that becomes very costly. But as we start to transition and we get into a production environment, we talked before the break about capacity. As we get that capacity, as we get a workforce and we understand how to do that, we will continue to look for opportunities to drive those costs down so that even though they're higher end weapons, they become more affordable and manageable in the future. And General, what about test and evaluation capabilities? Does the current DOD infrastructure Will that be able to address hypersonic test and evaluation? I think to date we've been very successful with that infrastructure. Uh, as, we're, as we've done a lot of this early work in the science and technology world, we're making uh, very small numbers of things to test. 
uh, it has done quite well. As we move forward in time, so just think forward in 20 to 23 when we're, we're not only now have fielded in the Army in 25, we field in the Navy, the second battery in the Army. We have to continue the advancement of the technologies, which is a set of, of flight tests, but then our soldiers and our sailors will also begin to do training test flights. So as a nation, um, our OSD counterparts that own the test infrastructure are really beginning to look hard at that, that infrastructure. How, how, do we, how do we create ranges at distance that can, that can handle the speed? And how do we change how we look at collecting data? You know, most everything we collect now is from the surface. Maybe we can collect more from the air. Maybe we can collect more from space. Uh, as we advance this technology, uh, we, we can't stop with what we're doing now. So it's a series of continued advanced testing, and then it's a series of training for our soldiers and sailors, and that's gonna increase the pace of the need for the test infrastructure to be successful. So we're good now, but we're gonna have to improve it in the future. And what about underwater testing? Yeah, so for underwater testing, as we talked before the break, um, that is a unique skill, and that is a unique requirement that we've got, particularly for submarines. We, as I told you, we understand how to do that, but you have to have a test facility that will allow you to, once you've done all the analysis, once you've done all the engineering, really prove that in an underwater hydrodynamic environment, you can actually get that weapon out of the submarine to the surface so that it can light off. So the underwater launch test facility, which, we're, which we actually just this past week uh, rebroke ground on, is absolutely critical to what we're going to do. Because as we take the technology forward, we've got to have that test platform to know that we've got it right before we actually go to that first submarine. So the other thing that we're doing with that test facility, back to as we talk about overall test facility, this is going to give the Navy a capability in the future because everything we do is not just I'm going to do it just for one system. That capability will be there so that as we look to the future for other types of weapon systems, we'll be able to use that facility as well. You know, General, we've been talking about <coughs> offensive strike capability, but what about defending against hypersonic weapons? Are we building a defensive capability? It's a great question, Mimi. It's everything we do. Uh, we haven't talked much about it here, but we include Vice Admiral John Hill, who's the director of the Missile Defense Agency. So every time that we do a test flight, it, we not only look at it from an offensive side, but from a defensive side. What data are we collecting? What systems can be put in place? And, and Vice Admiral Hill under NBA has the responsibility to create those defensive infrastructures uh, should our adversary choose to use that weapon system. So at the, at the pace we're moving, where traditionally we'd have a defensive set of work and an offensive set of work, uh, we can't afford that that bipartisan thing. We have to get together and we have to learn everything we can from every flight test. You know, I wonder if your joint work on this advanced capability, is it a model for, um, that can be repeated for other weapon systems, for other technologies that um, the, the, the DOD can learn from how you guys are working together and use that in other ways? What do you think, General? So I, I, Again, I think we're pretty lucky to have the partnership that we have. We, we, we have a great relationship. We've known each other for years. Um, w if we want to be successful in our nation, I think we have to duplicate this model to operate at pace and, and push aside some of the traditional bureaucracy, some of the traditional um, stovepipes that might be out there. And when you engage the entire enterprise, uh, the test community, the logistics community, the contracting community, the industrial-based community, and, and you bring them together, um, you, you realize that they're really the, as you heard before, the sum is greater than the individual parts. It's a constant fight every day to keep that focus and keep that moving. Uh, it is, it can be used in other programs. Uh, I have other programs with the Navy, uh, and we <coughs> duplicated this model in a second program, and it works just, it works well. It's not perfect by any stretch, um, sometimes Johnny and I get on the phone together and, and we're screaming at each other. Uh, but I tell you, we always get to the solution that's best for our nation and best for our service. Yeah, I, I'd just like to add to that because I think Neil is spot on. And, and I do think it's something that we can replicate across the Department of Defense. Maybe even if not from an entire weapon systems perspective, but of a lot of the technologies that we're developing, that others are developing, um, can be used in various systems. So 
we need to think not just about a whole system like what Neil and I are doing, which is we're de delivering a hypersonic weapon that we can both use exactly the same, but there's going to be subcomponents as well. And as the department looks at how we maximize the buying power we've got, and also from an acquisition perspective, the learning that we've got, how you take a program and jointly do it and move it forward rapidly without some of the, the historical things that have done in the past, to Neil's point, we're not cutting corners. We're not doing things that are not understood, but we're doing it in a manner that is at a pace that shows the sense of urgency this nation needs. And we're out of time, but thank you so much, gentlemen, for being on the program. Thank you. Thank you.